All right, welcome to JP to Raw. This is show number 120, and tonight we have Lightroom expert Rob Sylvan. Did I say your last name right? You did. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> if you know, if you've listened, watched the show, I butcher names all the time, <laughs> Rob. But tonight, I actually wrote it the way I thought it sounded. Yeah. I should try and say it. You're trying to fool myself to make me say it right. So <laughs> that may be the thing I do from the future because I got, I'm got i one for one. I got it right tonight. Yeah, no, very good. <laughs> very good. Well, thank you, Rob, for coming on tonight. Uh, I had reached out to you to come on and talk about some Lightroom stuff and some, some other topics. We, you know, If you watched the show, the last uh, show we did, I think it was 119, we did on Lightroom 6. We have no insight, Tim or I. We don't have any inside knowledge or anything, just things that we were thinking about what we'd like to see in Lightroom 6. And maybe later in the show, we'll get Tim, uh, uh, Rob's thoughts on what he, I don't think you have any uh, inside knowledge or any that you could share with us, but at least your thoughts on what you'd like to see in Lightroom 6 uh, with that. Well, Rob, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into Lightroom and got into photography? Uh, sure, yeah. Um, well, I'm kind of a more recent uh, bloomer with photography. It really started for me about uh, 13 years ago when my son, who's just about to turn 13, uh, was coming on into the world and we got our first digital camera. And at the time I was an instructional designer, meaning that I was writing courses that were at the time being uh, web-based type training. and. Uh, while I was doing that, we were always looking for um, images to use in our trainings, and I wound up, we wound up using a lot of uh, stock imagery, and uh, it was searching for stock imagery that I landed on iStock Photo and got involved with them uh, way back in 2001, and that really kind of just led me down this path of uh, where I had just finished getting my master's in education, I was going to be a teacher. I kind of got all down into this technology and photography uh, passion. This, you know, my 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 hobby really at the time, uh, and I just never looked back. And uh, and doing that has just opened up door after door. I started working uh, for uh, the National Association of Photoshop Professionals, as it was called at the time. Now Kelby One, uh, I got a job as the Photoshop help desk before Lightroom existed. And I was one of uh, three people doing that. And then when Lightroom came out, um, Nap decided to support Lightroom in addition to Photoshop, and I took over uh, all all Lightroom help desk. So I've been answering all Lightroom help desk questions for uh, for Nap slash Kelby One uh, since Lightroom came out. And in doing that, opened up a lot of other doors for writing opportunities and. I've written a bunch of books on, on Lightroom and, and a lot of different camera books and, and that kind of thing. And it's just been a really great uh, opportunity to, to do the thing that I really like to do, which is to create, take pictures, create pictures, and then give a lot back, helping people uh, through help desk and writing and tutorials. I write for Photo Focus now, and um, I can't even keep track of some of the other things I got going yeah. on. <laughs> yeah, over at Photo Focus, you write the uh, in the column uh, under the loop or something like that, I believe. Uh, under the loop is a uh, is my column in the Photoshop User Magazine, okay. Okay. Uh, which is a Kelby production. Um, so I've been writing for the magazine really, since since Lightroom came out and got added to the full magazine. I've been writing that column uh, for that, uh, and that's that's a lot of fun. Good folks there. So yeah, so I do a lot of Lightroom stuff. Well, so and, and doing it from Lightroom one to now, I mean that you know. Thank you for all that work because I, that must take an incredible amount of patience uh, that I don't have. But to yeah. get, to stick with it for that long and be still helping people is amazing. Yeah, well, I think you know that was where my kind of elementary ed, you know, background came into play. <laughs> you know, you you have to have a lot of patience to be a teacher. And uh, you need a lot of patience to be on any kind of support capacity. So I always feel a lot of sympathy for anyone who's in any kind of support capacity. But I'm really lucky in that where I'm just doing support for uh, NAP slash Kelby One members, uh, you know, it's people who are really kind of bought into that. They, they have access to other resources as well, not just me. So a lot of times I can direct them to lots of good stuff uh, that, that we have for them. So it, it's been a lot, and, and to be honest, I've learned so much doing that. I mean, you, you, you have to really, you know, know a lot to kind of get started in it, but 
I've been exposed to so many different workflows and so many different um, ways people interact with Lightroom and use Lightroom that I never would have probably ever discovered on my own. So it, it's always it always makes me try new things and experiment, and uh, so it's 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 really good. It's been a really good experience. You you know how often do we call customer service for whatever we're calling for for your internet for your TV for anything like that. Um, and you get somebody on the other end who is just reading from the script and is, is less than helpful. I can't imagine I'm calling on, with a Lightroom question and I get Rob on the phone. It's like, <laughs> well, I've just hit well, a gold well, line. It's all email based, so you don't have to call. Oh, okay, okay. So, well, but still, uh, I've, I've emailed Rob and, and I'm not getting a guy who's just going down a list. I'm getting someone who is an expert and who is going to you know, really be helpful. That is... How does somebody, you said that's just for the members. How does somebody become a member of that? Well, uh, anyone now, uh, Kelby won. So there was the National Association of Photoshop Professionals. And then uh, a few years back, Kelby uh, training came on the scene and was all online video-based training. And within the last year, uh, they decided to merge those two back under one umbrella, calling it Kelby One. So anyone who was a NAP member before, could still be in, or anyone who was a Kelby training subscriber before is now, you know, part of this. But uh, it's an annual subscription uh, as a Kelby One member, uh, and this I'm just one of the benefits. <laughs> there's there's a lot better benefits than me. I'm just one small one, but there's uh, you get access to all the online training. You get the ten issues of Photoshop User Magazine uh, a year. You get there's a lot of discounts for Kelby One members, and then there's uh, unlimited. Uh, email help desk support for Lightroom and for Photoshop. And uh, there's two people who do Photoshop, and they are just as knowledgeable in, about Photoshop as I am about Lightroom. And in fact, they know much more about Photoshop than I do because I I don't use it like I don't use Photoshop, but nearly as much as I used to. So. Yeah, me either. Well, that that's something that if if you know anybody listening is not checked out, is go take a look at that. That sounds like a a very a huge wealth of knowledge that's out there and available to, for photographers. So, Rob, you know, with all those years of having people call you and ask you questions and, you know, um, imagine about everything that imaginable, not call you, I'm sorry, email you, yeah. What what is there like a common theme that you could say or common themes, maybe it's more than one, that that seems to be the thing that, that troubles people the most with Lightroom? Yeah, well, you know, it really it really ties into kind of the bigger topic we, we, we kind of threw out was, as we might discuss around you know, comparing it to Bridge and Photoshop Camera Raw. In the beginning, most people, the biggest problem they have is really just understanding the whole Lightroom paradigm and, you know, understanding the relationship between the catalog and their photos. And some people have a really hard time wrapping their brains around that part. Uh, and I understand that because it's not, it's not like probably most any other program people are used to using. So, uh, that's that's a definitely been a consistent theme since the beginning of Lightroom, and it maybe it's decreased because there's so many people using it now. But it's still anyone starting off in Lightroom, unless you've got experience with databases and and that sort of thing, uh, it's it's a new it's a new way to interact with your with your work. Um, and then uh, aside from that, a lot of it is really comes down to the least sexy but probably most important parts of Lightroom, which is just the basic file management stuff, that people maybe run into problems or create problems for themselves because they don't fully understand that relationship between the catalog and the photos. So yeah, definitely those types of things. And, you, you know, for me personally, when I first went to Lightroom, and I think it was Lightroom 3 when I first went there, I downloaded it and I uninstalled it with first week. <laughs> And then I said, ah, I got to give it a little more time. So I downloaded it again. And it really, um, I didn't use it heavy like every day, but I used, I think it was like day 17 of the 30 day trial when it finally, something clicked with me and I go, actually, I really like this product. I am going to, this is going to be my new product. And, and it's been nothing but that since. You know, I use it, like you had mentioned, I use it probably 90 plus percent of the time, very rarely going back into Photoshop for things, spending most of my time in Lightroom. But, you know, one thing that, that 
one of the questions I still have, one of the questions that maybe people have related to what you're talking about is the catalogs and the file, the file things. Let me just tell you what I do, and then you can maybe tell me where I'm messing up. <laughs> is, is when I bring it in on the card, I have it go to two places. I have it go to my computer here where I'm going to edit it, and then I have it go to a server in another room which is running a RAID 5. So that's coming off the card. And the file directory I'm putting it in is by year, but by year than by day. I think it's by year by day. And I just have one massive catalog. I don't have two catalogs or 10 or whatever, just one big one with now almost 200,000 images in it. And I have it create the smart previews. And those smart previews take a while to create when I download. So there's this lag between when I download them and then really I don't edit during that time while it's creating those smart previews because it slows down the computer. And I rarely apply any kind of edits to it when I'm importing. Why do you do? Why do you create smart previews when you're importing? I read it somewhere. <laughs> that was a good thing to do. <laughs> so this, this is what you're doing for me. You're telling me, Mike, you're, this is not the I'm way not, to do it. I'm not saying it's bad or good. So <laughs> you know, let me let me preface this by saying we were talking about this er offline earlier. There's there's no one way to use any product. There's certainly no one way to use Lightroom. Yeah. Um, now Lightroom on the import phase of the process tries to give you the opportunity to do multiple tasks at once with a, with the intention that it's saving you time down the road. Yeah. All right. But by doing that, it kind of makes that whole process take longer. Right. There's no, as George Jardine, who's a former Lightroom evangelist, fantastic instructor and photographer, always used to say it when I was learning Lightroom in the beginning, there's no such thing as a free lunch in that yeah. you're either going to pay now or you're going to pay later. So you just need to decide when do you want to pay. Um, and so for some folks, they like to kind of, uh, you know, front load all that stuff, click that import button, and then go get coffee, go do some other task, clean their gear, make phone calls, take a nap, whatever they're going to do. Then they come back, and all those jobs are done, and then the rest of their process moves along quickly. Um, so the reason I said that was, you know, if you have a specific reason for checking the smart preview box during import, then by all means, go for it. But if you don't, and you're finding that, hey, this is taking longer than I'd like in my particular workflow, you can always render smart previews after the fact. And a benefit of, of doing the rendering after is that you might need to, I don't know, if you're like me, you might actually have some photos to delete you know, after mm -hmm. you get back. They might not all be five-star, you know, excellent images. So um, <clears throat> there's no need to render smart previews uh, of, the, of your lens cap or whatever, you know. Yeah, you get right. So um, it's very easy to, uh, to render them after the fact. And then the other part is, well, what's the benefit of a smart preview? And, uh, you know, that may be a whole other conversation, but in a nutshell... Smart previews were designed as a way to work with your having your main source files be offline and still be able to use Lightroom's develop module. Right? That's the primary purpose of a smart preview. But it has some secondary benefits in that if you do have a smart preview already rendered, you can experience a little bit faster uh, uh, performance in, in develop when you first land there. Um, but you might not notice that. So if you're not working with your files offline at all, um, you may not be getting the biggest benefit out of having a smart preview. And then the other side effect of the smart preview is that it stores a it stores the smart preview in a special cache file in a folder alongside your catalog, which can t can grow quite a bit. You know, can take up serious hard drive space. So. Right. Um, it's just something to think about. Um, I was just reading in the in the Nikki is putting in the chat about smart previews allow you to use an external hard drive with a laptop, and also if you have an older computer, rendering image. Yeah, so if you have an older computer after you've rendered them, maybe it helps. Um, so it's not to say smart previews are are not valuable if you're not working offline, but uh, depending on your system and your workflow. You, you may not be getting a super benefit from yeah. it. Yeah, so I think, you know, what I originally was doing, I read it somewhere. I was looking for uh, performance tips on how I can make the things faster. I do, I have a, to get a little bit geeky here, I have a Core i7, you know, overclocked a little bit with uh, the, the catalog on an SSD, the program on a separate SSD, 
but the video, the fo- photos are on a regular spindle drive. So I got a, and I got 32 gig of RAM. So I have a, ni- a beefy system. Yeah. But what I was experiencing, and uh, when I would go from one image to the next in the, in the develop module, it would be a, a, a lag. It would you know come up a little fuzzy and then come in and come in. And it was it was more lag than what I was wanting to have. So I w- was doing the smart previews to see if that would help with help with that, and it did seem to help with that a little bit. Uh, maybe it's not worth maybe it's not helping enough. Yeah, well, you know that's you know that's the call you, we each have to make. I don't use smart previews in that way, and I don't have half the you know BP system that you've got. And maybe maybe it just goes back to my being so patient. <laughs> but <laughs> you know, uh, it, it, it's just those are all the things you've got to kind of weigh out, right? So if you know if you want if you have lots of storage space, and your machine can render all those previews out, and you don't mind that, and you and you appreciate the the extra little zip when you're clicking through photos and develop, um, then yeah, maybe it helps. Another thing you might try, and this is again, you know, there's no no free lunch here, but if you check on on the import dialog, instead of creating a smart preview, try checking the uh, for um, regular preview, set it to one to one. Yeah. And that's going to again take more time. It's going to you know re- be some rendering. But I believe, unless they change that, when you render one-to-one previews, it kind of preloads the camera raw cache, which is used when you're in the develop module with a raw photo. So if you're shooting raw, that can maybe give you a benefit. I don't know if it's any better benefit than having a smart preview, but that if you want to do some testing to see what maybe works better for you, you know, get 100 images, import them both ways, you know, and see which see if, if you see any difference in response time, and, and okay. if that helps out. Yeah, so uh, that I need to give that a try. And I, I, Nikki did point out there that while the smart previews do create a, you know, they, they grow they, you know, as you do that, you can put some parameters around it where it will auto delete some of the older ones. Well, right? yeah, that's true. That's true for one to one previews, but not for smart previews. Oh, it's not you for can, smart previews. You can manually delete smart previews, but for, um, uh, on, when it when it comes to I'm just looking in the uh, uh, Lightroom's settings here. I think it's I don't think it gives you the same deal for the smart previews as it does for the one to one. The one to one you can set those so that after 30 days those do get uh, trashed. But I don't know if that same is true for the smart previews. So I'm just looking. Yeah, I don't see that for smart previews. All right. Well, I'm you can gonna... automatically discard one-to-one previews. Okay. Um, so, but the, but the smart previews but, then will just keep building up. Yeah, but you can manually delete those at any time. Okay. You, know, okay. you can you can purge those out. So you still have that control, and and you know it would be something that if you had a really high, high volume of photos, it might be an issue. Like if you were shooting weddings and you're coming back with 2000 images every night, you know, that might be a problem. But for many of us, it's probably not going to be any problem at all. Uh, as, as your system just grows, you probably will be deleting photos and you know, those things will clear themselves out. And someday you find you're just strapped on space and you go, Oh my God, I've got all these smart previews I can purge and you just get back, you know, Five gigabytes of space, ten. You know, I don't think it's really going to make that much difference. So I, I had to do that recently because, like I mentioned, I have the catalog, which I think the smart previews are there too on an SSD. And uh, while it's a, a nice size SSD, I think it's you know two fifty six or maybe maybe one twenty eight. Uh, it does it does fill up. I mean, that's not a lot of space when you start, start talking about some of these things. So yeah. I did that. I had to purge mine. Yeah, like you said, uh, going along those same lines. And St- Stephen has a question out there, but before we get to his. Yeah, I mentioned I have one catalog with like two hundred thousand images in it and growing. Is yeah. should does that impact performance? Should I be, you know, um, not having a master catalog, maybe having multiple catalogs that relate to subject or whatever? The reason I do it is now I have one catalog where I can search everything. Right. Well, that's what you what you describe is is the ideal case for for Lightroom. Like if you could like see the the whiteboard in, in Adobe's, you know, Lightroom think tank, it would be one person with one computer with one catalog. And that's kind of the default model that Lightroom works under because for exactly that reason, it, it allows you to leverage that database, that catalog across your entire photo library and allows you to manage it all with one point of entry. 
right? And uh, sure, over time, the bit, you know the more data you have in there, is that going to affect the performance? Sure. Why wouldn't it? I mean, yeah. but the biggest thing that's going to affect performance is always going to be hardware, all right? So if your hardware is reasonably up to date, uh, having one large catalog should not be a real problem for you. Um, if you're on a really old, old system that wasn't really that great to begin with, uh, you're going to feel that uh, in a much greater degree. So like say, you know, you had your system and I had my system. We had the same total number of files in the catalog. Our hardware is going to make the bigger difference. Now, say in your catalog, you apply settings to every photo. You've got keywords. You're adding titles and captions and ratings. And, and you're just adding way more data than I am. Then that might, you know, explain a difference in performance that that you're having that I'm not having. So there's a, there's a number of variables. Hardware is always going to be the biggest limiting factor, and then all other things being equal, hardware wise, then sure, the more data you have in there, the more work it's going to have to do. Um, but I I like you have a single catalog, um, and for some folks I know who go the multiple catalog route. Um, there's nothing wrong with that as long as you understand and have uh, a good system in place. So Lightroom can't search across catalogs. So that means if you have multiple catalogs, it's up to your brain to know what photo is in what catalog. Right. And you don't ever want to create a situation where you're going, well, gee, should I put this photo in this catalog or should I put it in that catalog? You know, you, you want to have a system that scales seamlessly no matter – which route you take so that you don't have to be making those decisions and then heaven forbid when you need to find something you're not going well geez which catalog was that in so like uh, an example um a friend of mine alan hess a contra photographer you might have heard of he's a super nice guy mm -hmm. and he uh does concerts and every show you know is he has a new catalog for every show last i talked to him and but he has a whole external structure for his files that he relies on so he's got one catalog per show and he, he his system is such that he doesn't need to use the Lightroom catalog to find a particular show he, he already has an external system that will guide him down that way a wedding photographer might be in the same boat where you have the Smith catalog the Jones catalog and you don't really need them all to be in the same catalog I was but thinking again, the same have, thing a wedding photographer yeah yeah so if you have a high volume and you have an external structure that makes sense to you and is scalable, then you can get by really well with multiple catalogs because it's, it's already kind of built into your structure. You just don't ever want to be thinking, well, geez, does this photo go in the landscape catalog or the travel catalog <laughs> or the, you know, you don't want to be creating more, more problems for yourself that, in that way. Now, uh, let's talk a little bit about the, the catalog versus the sidecar. So if you have a raw, a raw file... You're not using like DNG. You're using uh, like I shoot Nikon. You're shooting the the NIF the NIF yeah the NIF file. Yeah. It's, it's creating a, a sidecar file for that. But you also have so you have data in that, and you have data in the catalog. What what is in in one, and, and what is in the other? All right. So by default, if you're using Lightroom only, Lightroom does not write a sidecar file oh, okay. to your to your raw files. There is a checkbox you can check to turn it on and have Lightroom do that. But it doesn't do it by default, and that's because when Lightroom 1 first came out, the default was to also write to the sidecar file. And people at the time, and this was 2006, maybe when, when the beta came out, um, you know, had much older hard, hardware and were experiencing performance problems by having that box checked. So after that, uh, Lightroom disabled Oh, you still there? Yeah, I'm here. All right. Lightroom disabled the uh, – it just hung up. It just froze for a second. I oh, panicked. Sorry. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> uh, Lightroom unchecked that by default. So Lightroom only by default writes to the catalog file. All right? And so everything you do inside of Lightroom is being written into that catalog, whether it's adding a keyword, moving a slider, adding a rating, so on. All right? Now, if you are a Camera Raw Bridge user – then anytime you open a raw photo in Camera Raw and you do some work and you click done or you, then the Camera Raw plugin is going to write to that photo's uh, metadata. And if it's a, a proprietary raw file like an, an NEF file or a CR2 or whatever your 
camera produces for a raw file. Lightroom and Camera Raw cannot write into the metadata of that file, so it creates this sidecar file. Okay. Right? Now, where it gets interesting is that there's things in that Lightroom can only write to the catalog that cannot be written to a sidecar file. All right, so some people kind of do this thing where they kind of use sidecar files to kind of go back and forth a little between Bridge and, and Lightroom, and that's totally possible and feasible if you understand the limitations of that. But um, like, for example, Lightroom, inside of Lightroom you can create what's called a virtual copy, right. which is essentially an additional set of instructions that references the, sa the, the same source file. Right? Love virtual copy. Yeah, so that's great. But virtual copies cannot be written to an XMP sidecar file. Okay. Right? However, what can be is a snapshot. So the other thing Lightroom can do is save individual states, developed states of an image as a snapshot. Now, a snapshot and a virtual copy are kind of very similar. You know, they mm -hmm. except a virtual copy you can see side by side with your original. A snapshot you can only see in the develop module when you click through the snapshots. But snapshots can be written to the sidecar file. So there's a way to kind of, you know, if you do that, you can get around that. Um, collection membership in Lightroom, you know, that can't be written to a sidecar file. Yeah. Um, so uh, flags can't be written to a sidecar file. All those individual history steps as you're working in Lightroom and the history panel is just getting longer and longer, all, all of that cannot be written to the sidecar file. Only the most current settings are written to the sidecar file. So um, in Lightroom's case, if, if a sidecar file exists during import, so say you're imported, you've just got Lightroom, but you've already been using Bridge and Camera Raw, and so you have all these sidecar files uh, that have all your, your adjustments from in the past, then during the import process, Lightroom is going to bring in those photos and say, hey, photo, what do you got in your metadata for me? And it's going to give it all the EXIF metadata, any keywords, all that kind of stuff. But then it's going to say, oh, look. Uh, there's developed settings that are stored in this sidecar file too, and Lightroom is going to say, just take note of that and store that in the catalog as well. So Lightroom respects it during import. After import, though, Lightroom's primary focus is on what's in the catalog only, and you have to manually make it look at the sidecar file if you've done something outside of Lightroom. I, I know some people out in chat and, and maybe listen later, why is Mike keep asking Rob about this, but there's a, a few points. And some of the people <laughs> out in chat are starting to hit on it. <laughs> um, and one of the questions, before I get to my key points, you said st uh, flags can't be stored in the, in the sidecar file. I'd imagine it also means star ratings can't either. That's all. No, nope, star ratings can be. Oh, okay, I'm wrong there. So star ratings yeah, can just be. Flags. Just flags. Flags, flags cannot, uh, but star ratings can. Color labels can. Keywords okay. can. Title, caption, that all can. Okay. It's just flags. Flags, collection membership, virtual copies, and all the individual history steps going back to import. So there's two, there's two main reasons why I, I went down this path. One, I, I have a comment on. One, I'm going to ask you a question. So the first one was, I was going to say, if you listen to the show, you know, there's one thing I preach more than anything else, and that is back up your photos. You know, back up your photos. But beyond that, you really should be backing up not just your photos. You should be backing up a lot of things on your computer. But just talking about photography, you should be backing up your photos and your catalog. Make sure you're backing up your catalog, too, because all those things Rob just talked about that are only in the catalog, you would lose if you're not – you wouldn't lose your photos, but you'd lose all that other stuff if you're not backing it up. So yeah. back that up. The second one is my question, and Nikki hit on this. So let's say I have images in one catalog, and I want to move it to another catalog. Okay, I can have the new catalog just look at that file, but if I have data that's only exists in a catalog, is there any way to bring the, 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 that information from one catalog to the other? Yes. Yeah, and there's a couple different workflows around uh, having multiple catalogs where one of those catalogs might be kind of a temporary state. So, for example, uh, my main catalog is on my desktop computer at home. It's, got, it's massive. It's got over 100 and. 20,000 photos or whatever in it. Um, but when I travel, I take my laptop, and I don't bring everything with me. But I have a, a smaller catalog on my laptop that I use for demos and teaching and when I travel. But when I return home, I want to bring that new work that was done on my laptop and import it into my desktop. 
and not just the photos, but like you said, all the work that I might have done while I was uh, traveling. Right? So Lightroom has what's called a catalog import function, where you actually can import data from another catalog. It's very similar to what you, when you import photos, but it's focused on looking inside of a catalog file, importing that data, and, and it, it tries to do two things. It says, it looks at the photos in this other catalog and says, all right, are there any photos in this other catalog that are already in this master catalog? And if so, have they changed? And so we want to make sure we bring those changes in or give you the opportunity to bring those changes in. And then it says, are there any brand new photos that need to come in that don't exist in this catalog? So if, you, if you're in Lightroom, if you go to File, under the File menu, you're going to see Import from another catalog. So let's just say I had uh, two catalogs on one computer. Maybe, I, maybe when I started using Lightroom, and this is very common, uh, I started using, I started only having one catalog per year. Uh, I can't tell how many times people come to me with that one. Uh, I thought that would be a good idea. After a while, who remembers if you took a photo in 19, you know, in, in 2004 versus 2010 or, you know, it's like, so they want to merge it all back into one catalog. So you can just go to file, import from another catalog, select that catalog file from whatever that other, wherever it happens to be in your hard drive, and it's going to open up a very similar type of import dialog that gives you the opportunity to bring in that data, all the work that's in that Lightroom, that other Lightroom catalog, and also give you the opportunity to either leave those photos where they are, the source photos I'm talking about, or actually copy those to a new location if you're choosing. So that's how you would uh, bring in other folders or other work that's from another Lightroom catalog into your master catalog. And I do a similar thing when I travel. Like, say, on my master catalog, I've got a folder of photos that I just started, I just created, and I want to bring some of them with me on my trip to keep working on them. And I know that while I'm on my trip, I'm going to take more photos and add it to this catalog. So one way to do it is if you just right-click on a folder in the Folders panel, you're going to see an option to export this folder as a catalog. Another thing you can do is put all the photos, maybe they're not all in one folder, maybe they're across a range of folders, you can put all the photos you want to bring into a collection, right-click on that collection and choose export this collection as a catalog. Mm -hmm. And now you're creating this, this small sub-catalog of just the photos in that folder or collection. And it's going to, in that, in that little sub-catalog, it's going to have all the work you've ever done on those inside of Lightroom, including collection membership, virtual copies, all that stuff. All right? Then you, uh, you also have the option to render smart previews. So say you don't want to bring the source file, so you just render some smart previews on those so you can still do stuff and develop, but you don't really need the full size. Or you can actually, it's called uh, include negative files, which just means make include copies of the source file so that you create this kind of portable package that you can put on an external hard drive and take it with you. Mm -hmm. So now you... Go ahead. Uh, I'm rambling on, so go ahead. No, 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 that's, <laughs> I'm just thinking of how I would use this, and I don't know if this solves the question Nikki was just asking. You know, it's the thing is, that was not hard for to find. Once you told me it wasn't hard to find, I just never had gone there and done anything with it. So yeah. once you, I was doing a little bit there so people could see. I don't know how well you can see in chat unless you're using a bigger player. But um, that was really easy. Where I'm thinking my use case is, is my wife is I'm there in the basement. My wife's up on the on the uh, the main floor. She has Lightroom on her on her computer, but she only really wants to do stuff for scrapbooking for the kids. And she, you know, well, I she has wants to all those just for the kids. She doesn't care about the ones I've taken of God knows what. She only right. wants the ones of the kids. So I'm thinking <laughs> this would be really easy. I can I can go in. I can find the ones of the kids that she might want export them and uh, put them in their own collection, then export that collection, and then copy that file over to her um, uh, and the photos over to her um, drive and let her use that. Yeah. Yeah, that, that could work. And then she could import that into her catalog and just, you know, that you could create a system where you're just continually handing off chunks from your catalog in that system. And then the thing to remember is after, you know, that – that exported catalog is kind of a temporary transfer sure. station, you know, so you want to get rid of that so you're not getting confused about having multiple catalogs that you don't understand. Um, but, yeah, that, that works really well. Um, and then 
I think the you know another way uh, is we've seen that useful is if someone in a backup scenario where maybe they didn't do a really good job of backing up their catalogs and they have like an old catalog and they maybe I've seen so kind of so many crazy stories, but it just helps you to uh, transfer data between catalogs and it's really maybe not as intuitive or discoverable as some things are in Lightroom, but uh, it's really handy if you need to transfer stuff between uh, between catalogs. Okay, now one of the things that people have asked us, at least that's come up in our group a lot, is how can I make Lightroom faster? How what, what you know? <laughs> and for, for let me tell you, for, for most of the case, except for that smart preview that I talked about, and maybe I'm going to try a couple of different things there after we talk tonight. Um, but for me, what happens, I'm going through the develop module. Let's say I've gone and I've shot a swim meet. That's my, my son is a high school swimmer, and I've gone and shoot that, and I'm crazy with the shutter button, and I've taken 1,500 images. And I'm, I'm going through uh, an editing, and I've, I've narrowed it down to not 1,500, but another number. And I'm going through and I'm doing the edit, editing in the develop module, and it happens all the time is that I'm in it some amount of a way, and it starts to get slower and slower as I move from the next image to the next image. And all i got to do is close Lightroom, start Lightroom back up, and it's back to no fast speed. Yeah. So I, I don't know what's going on there, but I, I think some of the, qu the, the issues that people have had or some of the things people like to see is faster speed. Well, yeah, there's no such thing as too fast, right? So um, I think that there, there's no doubt that that will always be at the top of the list is, is they want things to move faster. And who, who doesn't want that? Um, what it sounds like you're having is more of a resource issue. Maybe there's some kind of memory leak or something going on that's shutting it down, you know, releases all that memory. You start back up and you're good to go. Um, so that, I, I don't know of like any trick to make that faster other than hoping that whatever the problem is might get addressed in a future update of Lightroom. Um, you could, you know, it's, it's a resi reasonably easy free f fix is to shut down and start up. Maybe it gives you a chance to get out of your chair and stretch your legs a bit. <laughs> um, I certainly spend enough time sitting in my chair that any opportunity to get up is a, is a, is one I should take. Yeah. Um, but aside from buying new hardware, um, really having, uh, having your system be, uh, really well maintained is going to help you out. So having things up to date, making sure you have ample free space on your startup drive, making sure that um, you know Lightroom is also up to date and those types of things, having enough RAM and that kind of thing. If you do a Google search, Adobe came out with a really excellent document about optimizing Lightroom. If you just like do a search on optimize Lightroom, you're, it's going to be right up at the top. Yeah, and it really steps it steps through all the hardware con you know concerns you want to address. And then it goes through some uh, settings that can also help, but ultimately, you know, you do all those things and have, you know, as good a hardware as your as your pocketbook will allow. Uh, I think you're still going to come. You're still going to hit a few walls mm -hmm. uh, if you're if you're a real power user. Um, have you ever customized your default settings I have. for your raw for your raw files? That that's something that a lot of people uh, don't know about, and that can make a big difference in in your in your speed, because by so let me back up. So Lightroom has a default settings for raw files for all cameras, whatever your camera, whatever camera is supported. Lightroom has a default setting for that. It's just the starting point, right? Mm -hmm. But if you for, if you go into Lightroom and every time the first thing you do is you set capture sharpening to a different value and you apply a different camera profile and you always use this particular tone curve or whatever those things that you always do. You can actually save those things as a new custom de default setting for that particular camera model, and you can even really get really granular and do it per ISO. If you've got multiple camera bodies, you can do it by camera serial number and have different settings for each camera. Um, but by doing that, that just saves you from doing those same clicks every time. Right. That way, as soon as your photos hit on import, there's no preset applied. This is just your default starting point. It's just already got you five steps ahead than what you were before. And I do a little bit of that. The, the, the now, now I'm drawing a blank. The uh, what is it called? The the camera calibration. 
Yeah. Camera, camera, camera calibration and some of those. And I, I don't have it down to the ISO, but I have like low ISO, medium ISO, high ISO as my starting point with, with some of the things like sharpening and, and a few other things. So I do a little bit of that. Yeah, that that's that that really can help speed people up. One thing is another thing to check is if you are uh, experiencing you know performance in the develop modules, especially, do you enable uh, lens corrections, lens profile correction, corrections I, by I default? I do. Yeah. Yeah. No, that. Uh, yes. Yes, I do. Yep. That that is something that um, definitely is resource intensive. So, okay. when Lightroom is applying a lens profile, it's doing some really intense on-the-fly math, right? So you think like a juggler has really got a lot of balls in the air trying to, and so when you add that one in, they're like, oh my God, you know, and so Lightroom is really working hard when that uh, lens profiles is enabled. And you're going to especially feel it if you then go on to do something like spot removal, mm -hmm. right? That's probably one of the most other resource intensive. So if you have lens correction, lens profile corrections enabled, and now you're down at one-to-one -one and you're doing a bunch of, uh, spot removal, you, you're going to feel it, right? So, but if you just uncheck uh, lens profile, uh, you're going to feel an improvement in performance. Okay. And, and it's one of those things that you can just turn on and off uh, as you need it. So I actually have uh, in my presets, one of my presets at the top is enable and disable that lens profile. So uh, I don't have it turned on by default anymore, but when, I, when I'm done with my kind of other stuff, I just turn it on. And then if I realize that I need to go in and do some spot removal or something like that, I just click it off again, do what I need to do, turn it back on again. So that's that's definitely something to check out in your testing. Yeah, I'm looking at the clock and I'm saying, holy moly, we could spend three more hours talking to Rob here. <laughs> <laughs> we've, we've barely I'm covered sorry, it. Uh, Tim couldn't get back in here. Yeah, he, you know, Tim is great at doing show notes. I can see him out there still writing some show notes, so he's listening. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, yeah. We, we can keep going. We're f I'm fine. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, we still got some time. I just was thinking, man, I just really scratched the surface. But I want to – there's one question that uh, Stephen asked. He's, it, I asked him to repost it because I'm not quite understanding what he's asking. Okay. Um, so I'm going to read it, and then maybe maybe uh, you can see what I'm, he's talking about. Okay, this okay. is St Stephen. He says, I'm confused. I import my RAWs from my card to my PC. Then I add my RAWs on import to Lightroom. I catalog my RAWs by business versus not business. So I guess he's uh, doing some pro and some non-pro. Yep. Then by camera and then by shoot, all outside of Lightroom in separate folders. Then, well, it went off the screen. <laughs> then I back up the folder to multiple hard drives. So I know one of the things I, there is I would do a lot of that file structure stuff just all within... Lightroom and you know how you import it. Yeah, well, it sounds like yeah. So Stephen, it sounds like one of the things I find the help desk is sometimes people use words differently than I understand them. Yeah, and so we have to kind of first get down to the vocabulary that we're both using is this means the same things, right? So when I hear somebody say I import my RAWs, I'm thinking Lightroom import dialog box. But I think reading between the lines here that maybe Stephen is meaning he's copying his photos from his card, memory card to his computer outside of Lightroom. And when he says, I catalog my RAWs, I think he means he organizes them. Uh, because when I hear the word catalog, again, I think of the Lightroom catalog, but I think he might mean he organizes his photos by business versus not business, which is maybe professional versus whatever, however, that, however you define that. And then by camera and then by type of shoot, all outside of Lightroom. So he creates a folder structure outside of Lightroom uh, based on all these parameters. And then when he actually clicks the import button on Lightroom, gets the import dialog, he's selecting that folder or top level folder of that folder structure in the source panel, clicking the add button. So Lightroom just says, hey, I'm just going to make note of where these are. I'm not moving. I'm not copying them. And so, because he's he kind of like you said, he does a lot of stuff outside of Lightroom that a lot of Lightroom users probably do inside of Lightroom after the import or part of the import process. And so, um, I'm not quite sure what his question is in there about he's being confused, <laughs> but I th I think we might have parsed out what he means. So, Stephen, what is your actual question there? 
Maybe, uh, or maybe you know. Do you know what his question is? I, I don't. I just saw what, what was there too. But uh, and that's okay. kind of how I understood it too. The same way, the same way you're reading it. So, Stephen, okay. if we've misunderstood you, let us know. But uh, you know, and Rob can can add to it or correct me if I'm wrong. But I would I would be using collections. If you wanted to have two different catalogs, business non business, I understand that. <laughs> but if you're wanting to sort it in different ways, like you talk about doing with a file structure, you can do a lot of that. With either file structure inside of, of Lightroom, or you can do it with uh, collections inside yeah. of Lightroom. Yeah, I, w I agree 100%. Because, I mean, like for me, where I do uh, stock photography as well, a lot, of the, a lot of good stock photography is actually stuff I might have done while I was with my family on vacation. You know, just that lifestyle stuff that just happens to unfold in front of your face, like you were telling me earlier about your your son with a hot dog. Yeah. You know, you might not have thought that it was a business photo. You were just taking a picture of your kid eating a hot dog. Um, whenever I start to think about like this kind of structure that would make me pause and think, is this a business photo or a not business photo? I don't ever really want to have to think about that at that stage. Uh, what where that might matter to me is if I use keywords. Uh, if I use collections, I might group photos in different ways, like, oh, I might think this is good for stock down the road, but I would have that all in one catalog, and I wouldn't really care if that photo lived in a folder that fell under business or fell under not business. Um, but again, it, I always try to tell, if, if, if your system makes sense to you, that's the most important person it has to make sense to. It doesn't have to make sense to me. Uh, it, or in any way, as long as you understand it and it's scalable to you, then God bless you and, and go forward. Um, so it looks like he's saying his question is, uh, is it better to have the system outside of Lightroom for purposes of backing up or does it create a copy of the file structure again inside of, oh, that's a great, great question, Stephen. This is a, a common one people ask and, and great to try and help dispel. So your photos are never, ever, ever, ever inside of Lightroom. Just pausing for dramatic effect. If you, <laughs> you know that, but a lot of people don't understand that, because that, that, the whole language around import makes it sound like Lightroom is sucking them into the program. So there's no, no photo is actually inside of Lightroom. The only thing inside of Lightroom is data about your photos, Right? And that's what's stored in the catalog. Your photos are only ever on your hard drive in some place that you choose to have them live. Okay, And so Stephen is, is creating that structure outside of Lightroom, that folder structure. Mm -hmm. And then using the import dialog, he selects add. Lightroom is not making any copies of those photos. They are still in their original location. They are not being moved. And Lightroom is just referencing all that's stored in that catalog is from the drive letter, if you're on Windows, from the drive letter to the file name and every folder in between. That path is what's stored in the catalog. And Lightroom says, hey, is that photo still there? Yep, it is. Okay, I can access it. All right? If you're on a Mac, it's just volume name to file name and yeah. every folder in between. And so if you create that structure outside of Lightroom and then import with the add button, that's totally fine. That totally works. It gets you to the same end result as me, who uses the copy uh, function on the import dialog, and I copy from my memory card to my permanent folder structure. At the end of the process, our photos are both in folders outside of Lightroom in a structure of our own design and what makes sense to us, and uh, no additional copy is made unless... When you're copying from a memory card, there is the option to make a second copy. Right? And that point right there is why I love using the import feature. Uh, there's other reasons, but that one right there is as it's coming off my card, I'm sending it to two places. So if I were to happen to have, I can't imagine what would happen here, but let's say the card somehow failed and the hard drive failed, I've got it in two places at, at, at that point. Uh, or don't have to wait for a backup to have happened. Let's say you download the card, you then go use the card, and before your backup happened, your main hard drive failed. Well, I've already got a copy of it on another hard drive. Yeah, well, that right there, what you just described, is the sole purpose of that make a second copy to box under file handling on the import dialog box. Yep. It is only a temporary, it's meant, it's meant to be a temporary, like, whew, got it in two places, my full system backup only runs at midnight or whatever, 
and I want to get make sure I've got this in two places before I format that memory card. All right? So if you use it in that way, that's exactly what it was designed for, and that's great. The thing you have to remember is you have to go and manage that folder because it's just going to keep growing over yep. time. And Lightroom, you know, it's like a reptile. It never looks at those ever again. It just lays those eggs and walks away, and it's, <laughs> it's up to you to manage that folder. So you can, that can just keep ballooning up, uh, and Lightroom will never, ever touch it again. And it, it is not meant to be a long-term backup, all right? So yeah. once Lightroom creates that second copy during import, if you go, when you're actually looking at your photos and you delete some, or maybe you make uh, derivative copies, or you rename them, Lightroom does not go back and update right. that folder with those changes, right? That's where your full system backup comes into play. And I, I look at them as something like the negative. So I am one of those guys who never deletes those. Yeah. And, uh, and actually the server that it's copying to is running crash plan. So within, <laughs> so within minutes of me doing it, boom, it's uploading it to the cloud. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're going to be one of those people who survives the apocalypse, aren't you? You've got, you're a Mr. Redundant Systems. I door. am. I am. Yeah. That's um, excellent. Before, before we uh, run out of time, a couple of things I want to ask you. One is, what is the thing in Lightroom you think that most users, that maybe the, 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 most, the thing that most users miss or underutilize? Um, that you see a common theme of underutilization. And I'm not talking maybe in some of the other modules like the map module or the, the um, or what, whatever you call it, but the, you know, in the develop module or in keywording or in something like that, the thing that you think is the most underutilized. Well, one of the things is, like I mentioned before, customizing your defaults. A lot of people don't do that. And they maybe rely on presets instead or, or just clicking all the same buttons over and over again. Um, so uh, if, you can, if you can customize your defaults, it's very easy to do. Um, and I could, I could show you or I can put it, I can I give you a tutorial that you can link in your notes or whatever. But um, you just take any un, unprocessed raw file into develop from your camera and apply the settings you want to be in your default. So that camera profile, you maybe you always, instead of having the Adobe standard, you like landscape or whatever you like. Right. And maybe you always do a little bit more contrasty tone curve, and maybe you always bump vibrance up to plus five or whatever the things you do. Dial those things in. And then go up under develop. Uh, there's the develop menu when you're in the develop module. And um, you're going to... Look under there, and you can see there's an option for set default settings. You can go to develop, set default settings, and Lightroom was going to give you somewhat of a scary message that says, change the default settings used by Lightroom and Camera Raw for the negative files with the following properties, and it will give you whatever your camera that you happen to be creating that image with. Please note, these changes are not undoable. Well, that just means the edit undo function won't revert it back, but you can always, always change your your custom default again anytime you want, or you can. Uh, there's a button on that dialog that says restore Adobe default. So you can always go back to what Adobe started with. Mm -hmm. uh, but I always, I really recommend, you know, choosing a camera profile that you always like, getting your sharpening settings, your capture sharpening settings that you like to use as a starting point. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm looking at that now. I have it pulled up for anybody who's who's watching on my on my thing. And I notice it says model Nikon D700, which is the camera that this image I have here yeah. was was taken with. And so it's that is something that is if I had an Nikon, I have an Nikon D2X also, that it would be a separate one for the D2X. That's right. You have to do it for every camera. It's camera model specific. And in using that versus just having a preset with some of those same features in it that I apply on import, what is the difference there? Well, the end result is the same in that the photo has those settings applied. The difference is that by customizing your defaults, you don't have to waste any time setting a preset, and you can leave your presets for more creative things, right? Okay. So think of your, your custom default as like your baseline. This is the place you like to start on every image, and presets are when I want to maybe amp up colors or go black and white or do some other thing that maybe is job specific. I don't know if you ever use any of those visual supply company uh, presets, develop presets that uh, are pretty cool. But there's a whole lot of creative stuff that you can use presets for 
to give yourself a different starting point. Save the you know the mundane stuff and customize your default with that. That's okay. the way I look at it. All right. Uh, the next thing is Adobe is Lightroom versus Bridge, and there's been some discussion in our group. Uh, should I be using Bridge, the the Coma images? Maybe not for the editing, but you know which one of the things that people who like Bridge as their edit as their culling process is the, the loop function that's in there. They like the loop function versus the you know. For me, I am an X was X and P in in the shift key. XP, yeah. XP, XP as I'm going through it. And if one I don't, I don't know from, the, from just the regular th the look, I might hit the, sh the shift key to zoom in and then shift key to zoom back out, and I can do that. But I know some people who maybe you've got three images up, and you pull the loop up on all three of them on the eye, and you can say, okay, this one has the better focus. I'm going to go with that one. So they like bridge versus, versus uh, Lightroom for the culling process. Well, you know, I think it's a matter uh, – there's a couple things. So – if if you're a Lightroom user, my recommendation is to stick with Lightroom, all right? Because nothing will make you faster at using Lightroom than just using Lightroom. And if you are kind of got one foot in Bridge and one foot in Lightroom, you're just going to be half-assed at both. Yeah. So, um, excuse my phrase. So you want to you know put your energy to the place where you're going to get the most uh, value over time and. You know, so in Lightroom, it doesn't have that loop function, but there's definitely really quick ways to zoom in. One is if you just, if you're in the grid view and you just hold the Z key down, it'll zoom you right to one to one. You let go of the Z key and you're right back in grid view, hmm. right? It's a real quick and easy way to zoom that. in. If you, if you, on the import dialog, render those one to one, check that box to render one to one previews. Then once those one to one previews are rendered, then you're going to quickly zoom right in to a, to uh, one to one. If you don't render that preview, then you're gonna have to wait for Lightroom to do it, and that might feel like a lag at first. But once they're done, they're done. So um, it sounds like the other thing, you know, if you're using auto imp, uh, the auto advance in Lightroom, and that under if you're in the library module and it go under the photo menu, there's an option called auto advance. If that's checked, then as you're what you were saying, using the P key for pick and the X key for reject, you can very quickly, just keeping your fingers on the keyboard, uh, pick and reject photos very, because as soon as you apply a flag, Lightroom automatically advances to the next photo. So if you expand beyond P and X, if you get to a photo that you're not really sure, you're kind of on the fence, and you want to keep moving, you don't want to move your, your, lose your momentum, press the U key, that's for unflag, it doesn't change the flag state. It just triggers auto advance to move you to the next one. Hmm. So you can keep on going with PX and then throw a U in there every now and then. And then if you need to zoom in really quickly, just hold down the Z key. You'll zoom right into one to one, check focus, release the Z key. You're right back in grid view and you can make your, your flag selection and keep on moving. And so uh, you can very quickly breeze through a lot of photos just with those few keyboard shortcuts um, inside of Lightroom. So Lightroom doesn't have the loop, but uh, to be honest, I never miss that. Uh, yeah. I, I did not know about the holding down the Z key. And I know if you're watching out in chat, you're wondering why, you know, what's happening here. So I, I can't show you me holding the Z key down. But if you saw me zoom in and zoom back out, I was holding the Z key down. Love that. That's awesome. Yeah. Now, if you, if you just press the Z, it'll zoom in and stay that way. Yeah. And then you can press Z and zoom back out. But if you just press and hold it, it just temporarily zooms you in, then you release, and you're right back in grid view. So um, you can you can make make through go through a lot of images really quickly that way. Now that said, so if you're if you're someone who um, so Bridge works really well if you're someone who maybe works in a multi-user environment. Uh, that's not Lightroom's real best case scenario. Um, you might find yeah you can make it work. People do make it work, uh, but you're not going to get all the benefits of Lightroom's efficiency by because you're not you're working kind of outside that model. So using Bridge and Camera Raw is great if you're in a multi-user environment because all the work is being stored in that Sidecar XMP file, or if you're maybe convert to DNG, there's no Sidecar file; it's just written right to the raw file. Um, and so you can open up Bridge and you'll see the work that I did. You do some work on those same files. I open up Bridge. I see the work you did. There's no syncing and there's no catalog. We just see what's there and move forward, all right? 
But where Lightroom's primary benefit over over that bridge camera raw workflow is is that Lightroom was built specifically for and for no other purpose than a digital photography workflow from beginning to end. Yeah. Bridge is is made to serve many many masters, right? It's the bridge in the creative suite, the creative cloud. You know, it's designed to help you with Illustrator and InDesign and Premiere and Photoshop. And because it can do that, it can do a lot of things. It can view video files and PDFs and Illustrator files and all that kind of stuff. And so that's that's powerful. That stuff Lightroom cannot do. But Lightroom can't do those things because it's not designed to do those things. And because of that, if you're someone who really is strictly a photographer, Lightroom is, once you really get to know it, is going to give you much better efficiency in your workflow by design. It was just because it, that's just how it was made. Um, so that's that's my soapbox on on that issue. Very good. And you, you <laughs> several things you said there, there. I took note as ah oh, man. If we just had, you're going to have to have you back, Rob, because there's a lot more questions I have. But you let's lead into some things that are going to take us to the end, and that is uh, some things that are in Camera Raw that's not in. Lightroom 5.5, and maybe it's a, like you had mentioned in the email you sent me, a sign of some things that could be coming in, in Lightroom, a future Lightroom. Yeah, so this whole uh, subscription model, not to talk about you know that, I know that gets some people quite worked up, but uh, it's, it's unique. It puts Adobe in a unique position in that because of this subscription model, they can add new features on a rolling basis to their subscription-only products like Photoshop now. So Photoshop CC 2014 was just released uh, very recently. And that is only available via some kind of Creative Cloud subscription, right? right? And there's the new photography deal, which is really a great deal, 10 bucks a month, and you get Lightroom and Photoshop um, and a couple and some space and whatever. But really, people just buy it for the Lightroom and Photoshop. And... What that just happened with the latest, with that last release of 5.5, uh, Lightroom 5.5 and Camera Raw 8.5, is that in Camera Raw 8.5, because it's part of the subscription only, they were able to add in a couple of, you know, relatively small but I think significant new features uh, in the Camera Raw module. That unfortunately, because Lightroom is still available as a, a standalone, uh, buy it once you get to you know own it type of license deal, um, which I'm, I'm not saying that's unfortunate. That's actually really good. I'm really glad that that's still available for people who don't want or don't need the whole subscription model. But because Lightroom exists outside of the subscription model, it's not, it doesn't enjoy that same opportunity for new features until a new, totally new version, whatever Lightroom Next uh, happens to be. But... What came in, in, in Camera 8.5 is the ability, uh, if you're using a graduated filter or a radial filter, there's now the option to edit that filter with a brush, Ooh. like the adjustment brush. Okay. And so the classic example is you're using the graduated filter for a sky. You Maybe you want to darken it or whatever. But there's a building or a mountain or something in the way, right? But you put that grad filter across that sky, but there's some object or element that jumps into it and now that object is being affected by your graduated filter well now with this brush edit mode you can turn that on and you can brush out the effect over that building person mountain whatever and so it's no longer being affected by that graduated filter adjustment so uh that is uh just a difference now that didn't exist before and I, people used to always say, well, they're, you know, I want to use Camera Raw. I use Lightroom, but I want to use... And I would, I would always say, well, you could, they do the same thing. So you're, you're not getting any benefit. But now I kind of have to say, well, except in this scenario, if you needed that, then that does exist. So yeah. there's a way to take advantage of it is in a Lightroom workflow. But it's only available to people who are also... You have to be subscribed. So... If you only if you just bought Lightroom five outright, then you're not, and you're not part of the Creative Cloud, then you can't take advantage of it. But if you're if you have Lightroom and Photoshop and you're in the cloud, then you can uh, and you have the latest version of Photoshop in the cloud, you can use the Smart Object workflow from Lightroom. So in Lightroom, you select a raw file, you can go to the the Edit 
in menu and at the bottom there it is uh, open as a smart object in Photoshop. And so what that does is it embeds a copy of your raw file in a smart object layer in a new document that opens in Photoshop. Okay. So you can double click that smart object layer inside of Photoshop and that's going to open that same raw file, well, a copy of the raw file in the camera raw plugin. And now you can take advantage of that. You have to make a duplicate of your original, you know, but so there's ways to kind of, you know, if you needed it in a pinch, you could do it. But uh, unfortunately, well, it, it sounds like that, though, like you had said in the, in your email, that that is something that may be coming in a future version of, of Lightroom because you're right. They used to have the, the camera raw and Lightroom were kind of in sync and now they're out of sync a little bit. So maybe we can yeah. see that coming. Any, well, we have to we have to hope that it is. I mean, I, I can only I, I can't imagine why it wouldn't. You know, why would they not include it? Yeah. But, you know. And, and speaking of what they would include, is, do you have anything you'd like to see in Lightroom 6? Well, I don't know. I don't have any list specific for, for whatever comes next. But in the future, you know, because I understand, you know, from working with this program for, for this many years, I understand that, you know, the timetable, the, the resources and the develop team that Adobe has on Lightroom you know, they're taking a very long view. You know, mm -hmm. it's not like they're just waiting to hear what we like to add to the next version. They're probably already thinking, if they've got maps probably going way, way, way into the future. <laughs> right, right. Um, and so things I'd love to see addressed in that, you know, long-term timeline is some of those, you know, things that we've talked about, but it's, it, is making, easing some of the pain points, uh, Performance certainly. That's you know any any time any performance improvements can be added into the software or any software, there's no one who's not going to be supportive. Right, of it. Right. Um, but just remember, oftentimes those things come at some other cost, right? Like smart previews and increased uh, storage, you know, resources. So there may there's no such thing as a free lunch. So sure. there you know have to work with the technology that we have available. So. The other thing I really like to see is a little more work done to help people understand this catalog model and understand how important this catalog file is. Lightroom is really good at trying to make it easier for you to get in and start developing your photos. And that's what people want to do. They want to get right into the develop module. It's very intuitive in the develop module. You move a slider and it gets darker or brighter, or more colorful. You, move, you just see it and it happens, right? But What's most important is that you understand where your photos are, that you back them up, as you said, that you understand your catalog is a separate file and what's in it, and that you back that catalog up, and that you know how to recover from some catastrophe, right? Some of that's outside of the bounds of Lightroom, but like one of my pet peeves uh, is that by default, Lightroom... Uh, in, if you go to under preferences, so on Windows it's Edit Preferences, on Mac it's Lightroom Preferences, and go to the General tab, all right. And the default setting for the default catalog is Load Most Recent, all right. So my pet peeve is if the ideal Lightroom user is some one individual with one catalog, then what's the point of having Load Most Recent because they only have one catalog, right? In my opinion, it should be what should be set there is the the exact path to your only catalog, right? Because what has happened, what I have seen happen more than one time is this load most recent setting is by default and nobody thinks about it. And they read some article by some bozo like me that says you should be backing up your catalog using the catalog backup function in Lightroom. And so they set that up and it's, now Lightroom, every time it exits, it says, hey, you want to do a backup? And you say, yes, I do. And it sends the backup copy, which is an exact duplicate of the catalog at that particular moment in time, to preferably another drive so that they're not all, you know, you don't want to back up to one drive and have that drive <laughs> right. take, get taken out by a meteor, right? So you want to have it in two different places. And then that happens maybe for a while. And then they kind of go one day, they're looking and their hard drive space is filling up and they noodle around and they find this backup folder and they go, what's in this? Oh, there's, there's a Lightroom catalog in here. Let me open this up and see what it is. And they open up, they oh. just double click on that catalog file and they open it up and they go, oh, this is just a Lightroom catalog from 2012 when I was backing up. 
isn't that interesting? And they shut down Lightroom and they go off and they come back next day and they fire up Lightroom and guess what catalog opens? The backup. The last one. Exactly. Wow. And then they start, but they don't realize that because Lightroom looks the same all the time, right? Sure. And so now they're working and they're importing new photos and now their primary catalog is now this old backup. And then they go, hey, wait a minute. Lightroom just lost all of these photos that I had imported in yesterday or whatever the time period it was. And then they email me eventually <laughs> and we have to sort this out. And so I see no purpose for load most recent catalog. Yeah. There's no reason to have it. So make the, at least you can leave it there because there's probably somebody in some audience going, I need that, you know, but yeah. make it an option, make it an option. Don't make it the default. So make yeah. the default either prompt me when starting Lightroom. So it actually makes you know where, what you're doing. Puts you in the driver's seat. That's what I want to see happen. Is either it actually hard codes in the path to the catalog that you use all the time, or it prompts you every time so that you actually have to make the decision, and then you make the connection. Like I'm not just opening a magic box here. I'm actually opening a file on my hard drive, and now I'm seeing the data inside it. It's like Microsoft Word. Imagine if you like every time you open Microsoft Word, it just opened a random Word doc. Yeah. You know, you you be like, what? I don't want to do that. You know, so. Um, you you should be able to to be in that to make that decision point when you're launching Lightroom, and this is like one of those places. Like really, so that's a very small thing, but it's still there. Yeah. <laughs> Lightroom. Box. And I have missed something huge. If you have a little bit more time, I want to ask you this question, and we can yeah, end sure, go for this it. question. Um, the, recently has come up in our group about the color space that you're using in the, in the develop module, and in I think it's this is going back to the bridge thing, and bridge are able to look at it in sRG sRGB, which is going to be the output color space. But in the develop module, we're stuck with looking at pro photo or something like that. And so the 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 clipping warnings and those kind of things we're seeing is only based upon uh, pro photo. and it and the the use case somebody was making was the fact that they thought everything was good, but then when they output the file, it got clipped, and I guess they weren't using the soft proofing. They got clipped because they they thought that they had done everything well, but they were really out of the color space. Right. Well, so if you're seeing that, imagine you're looking at that in sRGB. It's still being clipped, right? Right. So let me back up. So when you when you're shooting in RAW, there's no color space in RAW, right? It just captures all the data. Right. It's got all the data, right? And so. It might be a you know twelve bit or fourteen bit raw file, right? And so you bring that into Lightroom, and Lightroom uses a sixteen bit editing space and a color space that's very similar to Profoto RGB. It's not exactly it; it's very it's built it's based on that. Yeah. And so you're looking at all as much data as is in this file as you can, but what you're still seeing on your monitor is limited by the monitor's color space, right? Right. If if we could say get an sRGB preview of that instead, what we'd be seeing is we'd be having the software do the color conversion for any colors that were out of gamut to fit inside that sRGB color space. And we'd be making our editing decisions based on that. So ultimately, when it Lightroom's purpose of giving you all that data to work with is the more data you have when you're doing your editing, the smoother those error rounding errors are, the smoother those gradients are going to be, the the better, the more data you have to work with, the better your final product is going to be. And then when it comes time to output, no matter where you're going, your output device is going to have a smaller gamut than what your original raw file had captured. Okay. Whether it's on your screen, on a projector, whether you're printing, website, whatever you're doing. So, um, if there's like extremely saturated colors, because that's really the problem, is is the saturated side of, of the spectrum. So a gamut is just a, a contain. Imagine a container of the most saturated colors, red, green, blue. You know that you that an image can contain in this so sRGB color space. Profoto just allows a much wider, uh, more saturated range of colors. All right. So when you're going to output. Those that data that you capture originally has to be converted to this smaller color space, and in certain cases those colors will be out of gamut, and so 
the software has to make a decision. Do we just clip those brighter, more saturated colors to what we can contain? Or do we kind of shift all the colors in the image to try and approximate uh, what, what we've got there? So yeah, soft proofing might have solved that problem better than just seeing an sRGB preview. Because then you're you kind of be like work. You might as well just shoot JPEG then, yeah, because yeah. you're not you're not taking advantage of all the data that you've got uh, at your disposal, and that's that's the whole purpose inside of Lightroom and the develop module is, is to leverage all that. Because um, you're working but, with the raw the raw image and and with Lightroom, right? That's right. Yeah. So Lightroom, you know, assuming you're shooting in raw, then yeah, sure, you yeah. you have all that raw data at your disposal to 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 push around, and maybe you don't need to push it too much. Whatever you know, however you shoot, it really will depend. But um, but you want to have that there at that point, and then sure, when you're going to output, that's what the soft proofing function is, and you can soft proof for sRGB or Adobe RGB or a printer profile or whatever your output destination is going to be, and that might give you a sense. It's not really perfect, the soft proofing function. It's not really perfect, but it might give you some sense of how that output gamut is different from what you've got uh, in the beginning. But for the most part, you probably shouldn't really notice it, uh, that, that drastic a difference, unless you have really saturated, like, reds or really saturated pinks. You know, those, those tend to kind of maybe take the biggest beating. Yeah. Uh, I think yeah. in this case, the user was, have, was, was saturated reds, and they, they were showing an example of the warning, the clipping warnings you got in Bridge and the clipping warnings they got in soft proofing of in Lightroom, and it was different. And maybe that is something that's happening with – with the newer camera raw they're having, and it's something we will have later on in Lightroom or something. Um, but yeah, I, I, for That's me, right. for me, I haven't had a problem with it. But I want to end on that because I've gone way past the time I told you we would go. And, and That's all right. That's Rob, all right. Uh, this has been fantastic. Thank you for coming on. Uh, we could, I could have easily kept, just keep going for a couple more hours because <laughs> I wrote, I wrote down some notes and some mental notes too on things. If we have you back, when we have you back, is some questions I want to ask. But there's, there's, you know, we just touched the surface of Lightroom. Uh, there's lots of stuff we didn't go over. So I appreciate you coming on tonight. For anybody who came in later, I, th I think I saw a couple people come in late. Or Nikki he had to leave a little bit early. You know, we recorded it. It'll be out within a few days on all the different places: iTunes, Stitcher Radio, um, TiVo. Mentioned TiVo, and all those places. And Rob, where if people want to get in touch with you. What is the best place for them to get in touch with you? Uh, well, uh, my blog, uh, Light Rumors, LightroomERS.com is a place I, I try, you know, probably the easiest place to actually contact me that way. Uh, but I blog for PhotoFocus.com, so I try to regularly appear there. But on, on Google+, Plus, I'm pretty accessible there, Rob Sylvan, um, Facebook too so any of those places i'm pretty i'm pretty easy to find actually i'm pretty pretty kind of out there so and i'm happy to you know i answer lots of questions about lightroom all day uh so i'm happy to help out folks uh if they have a question and you have written a number of books uh one of them is on at least one of them is on lightroom i have yeah. one up here lightroom five I have, uh, yeah i wrote a lightroom lightroom two for dummies <laughs> way back <laughs> when and uh then uh, the, the same publisher had me update lightroom five book uh that uh, came out when Lightroom 5 came out. And you wrote some on some different cameras, looking at now all your am all the stuff. Yeah, I write a number of... Uh, the Peach Pit Press has a series called Snapshots to Great Shots, and I have been fortunate to get to work on a lot of the Nikon models there uh, in the last couple of years. And so I, I've... I can't. I've kind of lost count. Maybe five or six of those uh, as well. And I did one on stock photography mm -hmm. about four years ago uh, as well. I just got to the bottom of the page and thought, wow, that is extremely impressive. He's got that many on this page. And I realized it's page one of three. There's, there's two <laughs> more pages to go. Well, they, yeah, they, they probably duplicated that. Yeah, too. well, very, very um, impressive. So I check out. A shout out to Stocksy. I even wore the shirt today. There so you go. Stocksy is a stock photography co op that I'm on the board of. And okay, very good. We'll, we'll have the links to all that and to, and to your. Um, your, your books there too and our show notes and all that and we'd love to have you come back at some point and talk about 
Um, I can't have you come back every time at Lightroom because I will be abusing you. But <laughs> maybe some, sometime in the future to talk about stock photography. That's a that's a uh, in, very interesting uh, topic that we've only covered once on the show, way back in show number two, when probably the only listener was my mom. <laughs> uh, so it's, it is definitely past time to do that one again to go over that yeah, subject and, again. And you had my friend Nicole Young on, is that um, right? What's that? You had my friend Nicole on. We did. One? We didn't talk about stock. We talked about yeah. food photography, which she's oh. one of the many things she's excellent at doing. She was, you know, amazing food photographer. Uh, so we didn't talk that about stock with her. So oh, okay. that's a little subject we need to cover at some point in the future. And if you are not a member of our Facebook group already, you know, go out there and join that. We have a monthly photo challenge that gets you. It's a, def a bunch of different topics. Every month is a different one, and it, it keeps you uh, doing different things. It, so do that. You don't have to be a member of the Facebook group to, to enter, though. We do have it on our website. You can do it through there. If you, the best way to get the show every week uh, is through subscribing, and you go to our website and there's a link there to show you how to subscribe. But we're on iTunes, like I mentioned before, and a lot of other places. And if you want to join me and that make me not feel alone, go out to our forums. We have a forums. It's excellent forums. They're really good looking. There's just not a whole lot of content <laughs> there yet because I'm all by myself. But if you want, if you want to just go there and look at the beauty of them, uh, go there and look at, uh, go there and join us in the forums and, and help me get those things going. The other thing in the forums we have, and you could have saw this if you went earlier, is we have who's coming up on the show. So you could have seen Rob was coming up, and I have I put in the show I put in that some links to that person. So you could have gone and looked up Rob's website and Facebook and Twitter account and all those things before. Uh, the show if you wanted to so you can go and see who's coming up next but speaking of next next two weeks tim who just said thanks for coming wish i could have stayed on uh, sorry chat. tim <laughs> <laughs> tim was going on vacation for two weeks so we're going to take a pause for two weeks that gives me some time i want to do some hardware changes around here gives me some time to do a few things but check out the calendar for what's coming up next we got an exciting end of the summer and uh fall season coming up so rob thank you for coming and everybody out in chat and watching this will until next show, keep it raw. Good night, everybody.